بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم اشرح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله إن شاء الله I'm going to follow this book which is a book written by Sajiko Murata and William Chittick called The Vision of Islam and I'm going to follow it quite closely I would appreciate if people read the sections for this week if you could read the preface, the introduction and then up through Islam. So that will be 34 pages. And careful reading would be advantageous. I would also hope that we're able, I think the class is small enough to have some discussion about it towards the end of the class. I want to say I taught this book once before to a group of non-Muslim teachers. And I personally think it's probably the best thing in English that I've seen as a basic introduction it's actually not that basic because it's actually quite deep exploration of the tradition of Islam. And in just rereading this section, I've actually read it a few times, but in rereading this section, I was remembering why I liked the book so much. So I think that people will enjoy it. I think it's useful also for Muslims, not just for non-Muslims. What I appreciate about the book is that there's two ways religion is looked at. In the West, they call them in vocabulary of religious tradition in universities, normative approaches and descriptive approaches. A descriptive approach is the more common approach. It's the anthropological approach. It's an approach that looks at how a religion manifests itself in a society, how people behave, how they express their religion, the practices. This will include folk practices as well as practices instituted by the religion. It will also bring up some very bizarre things because human beings do very strange things and they will often do them in the name of religion. And so that will be seen as part of the religion and that from the perspective of a scholar of the religion, by a scholar I mean a devotional scholar, because again, in the West, they differentiate between devotional scholars and between scholars, what Dr. Cleary sometimes calls scholars for dollars. Those are people who earn their living in institutions, and so they will study something as a way of making their living, whether they believe in it or not. And so many people will teach religion that don't believe in religion. And they will tend, that perspective of religion will taint the way they teach the religion. And I went through a religious studies program at a California University. There was an incredible difference for me between the classes that I took with somebody who was actually within, working within a tradition and, and was a believer in a tradition. He was a devout Catholic with a deep interest in Zen Buddhism. And the classes that were done by people that did not believe in religion, the type of approach that's taken by somebody that does not believe in religion, even if they're attempting to be objective, it will still taint their view of religion. And that's the nature of human beings. We look at everything through filters. And anybody that looks at Islam will look at it through filters. Now, Muslims will look at their religion invariably, and they point this out in the introduction, defensively because they believe in it, whether they really understand the religious tradition or not. There are some Muslims out there that I think if they found out what their religion really said, they might even leave their religion because it's inconsistent with their view of the world. There are other Muslims, and I think it's the vast majority of them, that it will only strengthen their conviction in their religion the more they got to know their religion. There are some non-Muslims, if they studied Islam, they would convert to Islam. There are other ones, it will actually uh, increase their belligerence towards Islam. And then there are other ones that they might not convert, but they will have a deep respect for the tradition. So everybody brings filters to whatever they look at. And they admit that in the introduction of the book. So what I want to do 
is just look here a little bit quickly at the preface and then go into the introduction. One of the things that they explain that they're attempting to do is explain Islam both to Muslims who, as a general rule, know nothing about their religion but are defensive. And that is very true. Most Muslims don't know anything about their religion in any deep sense of the word. If you actually ask them to tell you things, you would be surprised at how ignorant many, many Muslims are. And then to Westerners who know nothing but are instinctively hostile. So you're dealing in an environment. One of the things that Dr. Cleary says in his book, it's an introduction in his book called Zen Cohen's. He says that an American who believes him or herself to be liberal, open-minded, unprejudiced, will display the most extreme prejudices if asked about Islam, a religion that he probably knows absolutely nothing about, but immediately will begin to voice opinions about which if he voiced them about something else, he would feel he was prejudiced, that it would be unfair to do that. So it's very interesting the hostility that a lot of people have. There are many reasons for that hostility. There are historical reasons for that hostility. Islam for centuries was the most powerful force in a large part of the world. For that reason, other peoples either lived reasonably harmoniously with the Muslims, for instance, the Chinese. The Chinese traditionally had very good trading routes with the Muslims. You know that China is actually bordered by several Muslim countries. And then a large segment of China became Muslim. And there's indication that the Chinese actually very early on were introduced to Islam. And within the Chinese tradition, in one of the books written by a Chinese scholar, they say actually that a delegation of Chinese was sent to Medina to meet with the Prophet ﷺ. And another delegation met with Umar ibn al-Khattab. So the Chinese early on became exposed to Islam and had actually quite good relations with the Muslims. There were battles. In fact, early on in the 8th century, when some of the Chinese paper makers were captured in a battle, they were taken to Baghdad and they taught the Muslims how to make paper because paper was invented in the first century AD by a Chinese man, Tsai Lun, who is considered really one of the most important figures in history because of that invention. So the Muslims had good relations. They had generally good relations with the Africans. Uh, Many of the African peoples became Muslim. In black Africa, Black Africans were taken as slaves often, so there was some antagonism definitely between the southern black Africans. Many of them became Muslim. Antagonism continued on in West Africa because of the slave trading that went on. And often they were black African Muslims, but they would go down into places like the Igbo land in Nigeria or the Yoruba. Many of the Yoruba became Muslim, but there was antagonism. So in some areas you had good relationships based on trading, and in other areas you had problems. Now, the West generally has had an antagonistic relationship with Islam. Initially, that is not always the case, and there are extraordinary cases of cultural flourishings that occurred, certainly during periods of time in Spain, when Muslims and Christians and Jews actually lived together harmoniously and quite productively. There are other periods when they did not. For instance, a large segment of Italy was under Muslim rule for a period of time, and the Pope actually paid jizya for 80 years, according to Arnold Toynbee. So there was a period when the Catholic Church was actually under the yoke of Islam. Islam went all the way up into the northern climates as far as Denmark. Vikings actually became Muslim. Vikings came down, fought against the Spanish Muslims and the Portuguese Muslims, were defeated and some of them actually became Muslim, and others went back to Denmark, and some ended up staying in Spain and become the Normans, and they invade England. Then you have also the Irish. The Irish connection is a very interesting connection. The Irish connection to the Muslims is is very old. It predates certainly Protestant Christianity that comes into Ireland, and there have been monasteries with Arabic writing found in Ireland. The Bismillah Rahman Rahim has been found in churches in Ireland. Irish music is heavily influenced by Andrusian Arabian music, which was influenced by Persian music, because that's really the source of most of the Islamic 
music that emerges. So a lot of this history is unknown. And the reason that it's unknown is because not very many people really read historical sources. Historians tend to be interested in certain areas. People that are interested in the Islamic phenomena in Europe would naturally be the Muslims, and very few Muslims that study history anymore, unfortunately. Uh, Ahmed Matar's book, which is called Islam in England, is an important book, but it's only the beginning because there was actually, for instance, there was a Muslim period of Muslim rule in England. And there are coins that were coined in England with Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim on them. There were the renegados who were Europeans that actually became Muslim and returned to their countries. English people rose to prominence in places like Morocco. There was an English man who became Muslim and ended up becoming a minister in Morocco. So the history, it's just immense what is out there and needs to be looked at. There have been periods of antagonism and periods that were not so antagonistic. But generally, the general rule is the Europeans felt that the Muslims were a deep threat to them. In Spain, one of the ways Spanish people say that things are fine is they say, no hay moros en la cosa. There's no moors on the coast. In other words, there's no Muslims around. That's still used in southern Spain as a way of saying I'm doing fine. Also, obviously, the Song of Roland, and if any of you studied literature and did the... uh, Norton's anthology, you would have probably read the Song of Roland. The Song of Roland is in praise of defeating the Muslims and the loss of Roland at the hands of these bloody Moors. Charles Martel, when he defeats the Muslims at the Battle of Tours in the 8th century, this is a turning point for the Muslims. They turn back, they stop their conquest in Western Europe and turn back and focus on Spain. And for the next 800 years, Islam is in Spain, which is European Islam. And on the other hand, you had the Ottomans who took up the idea of jihad and took up the idea of spreading Islam with the sword. And for that reason, they were constantly invading and attacking Christian Eastern Europe. And they get to Vienna, and people might not know, but the croissant is actually made by a Viennese baker after they defeated the Muslims in celebration of eating or devouring the crescent. So next time you eat a croissant, that's where it comes from. So there is hostility. It's historical. But generally, most Western people are ahistorical, like most Eastern people. They don't know much about history, but if you grow up in this country, you probably grew up with cartoons like Crusader Rabbit, with ideas of the Crusades. The Moors in all those films, like El Cid, were always portrayed as dark, swarthy, and violent. In some of the earliest films in this country, like The Sheik, which was with Rudolf Valentino, the Muslim is portrayed, again, as he's quite romantic, but in the end, it turns out he's not really an Arab. He's a European. So it was all right for him to take the European girl. The idea that there is antagonism is serious, and it's one that Muslims have to look at very seriously, but it's also something that Western people need to challenge themselves in trying to look at Islam with less hostility. Uh, it's, it's difficult. So that this book is an attempt at presenting Islam to Muslims in a way that is going to satisfy them, in a sense, and I think they do a reasonably good job of that. And I'm going to point out the things in the book that are problematic. There are a few things that I found that I thought were problematic, but generally it's a very good book. I think it's very useful for understanding Islam. The reason that I'm interested, one, teaching this class, and two, in looking at this, is because one of the things that we forget about Islam, and they point out in this introduction, I think very beautifully, is that Islam is a holistic tradition. It's a totality. The Quran says, You believe in a portion of the book and disbelieve in other parts. When you take Islam, you submit to it. That's what it is. It's submission to a total worldview. It is a way of looking at the world. There are many people who are Muslim that do not look at the world with the eyes of Muslims. They look at the world with the eyes of people that have been trained in Western universities or in Western worldviews, and they don't realize how tainted their views are. There are many Muslims that are so disconnected from Allah that they really don't experience anything of the divine in their daily lives. And so they live lives that are very divorced from a deep, rich spiritual tradition. The beauty of this book, I think, is it's an attempt to look at Islam in a holistic way. 
and it's based on the Hadith Yibril. One of the things also that's very interesting, I know that William Chittick studied in traditional madrasa, at least for some period of time. So he knows the, the tradition and he's very, very adept at uh, translating texts because I've read his translations and I know the Arabic work he's translating and I think he's very adept at what he does. And also his wife, Sachiko Marata, who co-wrote the book with him. One of the things that they say is that classical texts ask too much for the beginning readers. They were not written for people coming from another cultural milieu. Rather, they were written for people who thought more or less the same way the authors did and who shared the same worldview. It's very dangerous to read a book by Imam al-Ghazali and not understand that Imam al-Ghazali is working in 6th century Eastern Islam. And if you attempt to apply your standards or your criterions to the Imam, you're doing them a grave disservice because it's simply not fair. On the other hand, his tradition, the Imam's tradition, definitely says something to us today. Imam al-Ghazali is as relevant today for us as he was when he was writing because he's writing about universals. On the other hand, there are going to be things in Imam al-Ghazali's book that are not relevant today because they relate to his time and place. Another thing that he says, as a general rule, they were written for those with advanced intellectual training, a type of training that is seldom offered in our graduate schools, much less on the undergraduate level. Now, anybody who's worked in traditional Islamic texts, one of the things about, for instance, Imam al-Ghazali, he assumes in most of his works, not in all of them, because he wrote some of them as popular works, in most of his works he is assuming that you have been trained in grammar, in rhetoric, in logic, dialectic. He's assuming that you've been trained in poetry, in prosody. He's assuming you've been trained in mathematics. He's making these assumptions when he writes his book. And so you will find things that even if you know Arabic, if you don't know logic, you don't realize that he's actually using terms that don't mean what they mean to the average Arabic reader. They actually mean something. It's a technical word. It's a technical term. To study in classical texts, one has to go through a classical training. And if you don't, you're just not able to do it. And that's why you will see gross mistranslations of classical texts, gross mistranslations, because people don't know the requisite knowledges that are needed to examine the text. Now, one of the things they mention also is that the texts were basically outlines of an argument. Anybody who studied any of our classes with any of these traditional texts, that's what you'll note. You're dealing with an outline. Texts tended to be pegs upon which the teacher hung the meanings or the commentary. That was how the traditional Muslim world transmitted knowledge. When you learned the alfiya, it wasn't enough just to know those lines of poetry. You had to know the commentary. You had to know all of the examples in order for the rules to become meaningful. So another thing is that the students did not borrow the books from the library and then return them the following week. They didn't buy them at the local. They had to copy them out by hand and spend several months or years studying it word by word with a master. Now, I personally did copy out some of the texts that I wrote because they weren't published. They weren't available. And there's a great benefit in doing that. And I'm glad I had that opportunity. And then I would sit and word for word, the sheikh would comment on the text. Having the opportunity, having studied Dozens of books like that with teachers has been immense. Sheikh Muhammad, on the other hand, has studied hundreds of books. He studied, I think, 400 books with his father. A lot of them were reading them, but many of them were word-for-word commentaries on these texts. Generally, if you had a good training, you would have studied at least 30 or 40 books well before a teacher would let you move on your own and be able to study from the text. Now, this also, I think, is very interesting. We are perfectly aware that many contemporary Muslims are tired of what they consider outdated material. They would like to discard their intellectual heritage and replace it with truly scientific endeavors, such as sociology. By claiming that the Islamic intellectual heritage is superfluous and that the Quran is sufficient, such people have surrendered to the spirit of the times. Those who ignore the interpretations of the past are forced to interpret their text in the light of the prevailing worldview of the present. This is a far different enterprise than that pursued by the great authorities who interpreted their present in the light of grand tradition and who never fell prey to -to up-to-date 
the most obsolescent of all abstractions. So one of the beauties of the ancient tradition, a writer writing in the 12th century is writing from the same worldview as a writer in the 3rd century or the 4th century, really. And that's why there is a continuity of interpretation. They did not succumb to the temptations of the time. And one of the things that the moderns do is they interpret everything in light of their time. And then people later will look back and realize how ridiculous much of what they came up with sounds. And that is why if you look at the 19th century, uh, phrenology was considered to be the most up-to-date way of understanding personality. And that was like feeling bumps on people's heads to determine their character types. This was considered deeply scientific in the 19th century. And likewise, there will be things today that 50 years or 100 years from now, people will wonder and marvel at how people could fall for that type of nonsense. This is one of the dangers of that. And then he says, another thing that we find often in short histories of of Islamic thought, intellectuals appear a bit foolish for apparently spending a great amount of time discussing irrelevant details. Muslim scholars would go into great detail about certain things, and there's kind of an idea that they were really irrelevant issues. What he says, in fact, much of what they were discussing is being discussed in the contemporary world, but just in different terms. So we have semantic analyses going on now. We have people that are deeply involved in the analyses of language. You will find that amongst the Muslims historically. Some of the most extraordinary scholars of grammar emerged out of the 3rd, 4th, 5th century of Iraq. In fact, there has been a PhD thesis that was done by one scholar, showing how a great deal of modern linguistic theory is actually comes out of 3rd and 4th century Iraq from linguists that read that material and basically used it to present their own ideas. And that's something Mark Twain said, the ancients stole all of their best ideas from us. So that's an old game, reading ancients and coming up. If you look at some of the most popular authors out there. And if you've read the classics, you know exactly where they're getting their material, but they make it sound like it's update and new because if you said it was Epictetus who was saying those things in a self-help book, it would sound a little trite. How will I be helped by a slave who lived almost 2,000 years ago in Rome? And then finally he says that We as authors have our own lenses. Some people may criticize us for trying to find Islam's vision of itself within the Islamic intellectual tradition in general and the Sufi tradition in particular, but it is precisely these perspectives within Islam that provide the most self-conscious reflections on the nature of the tradition. So they're definitely working from an intellectual tradition, and it is a classical tradition. The Sufi tradition is not the Sufi tradition that many people now speak ill of, but rather most of the scholars of the past, our greatest scholars, did have a perspective that was rooted in their own spirituality and in an interpretation and an explanation of Islam based on that that was in fact part of the science of tasawwuf, what is called tasawwuf. So that is not an innovation. It's in fact part of the tradition and, and that's what they show. Now, in the introduction, basically they say that the religion was established by the Qur'an through the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. A Muslim is one who submitted to God's will or one who follows the religion of Islam. The Qur'an is a book that God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam by means of the angel Gabriel. And this is the basic story. That's the story. And now to flesh that out. Over 1400 years ago on a, a mount outside of Mecca in which a man was meditating and an angel came to him and told him, Iqra, read. And this was the beginning of the revelation, which is called Wahi, the Qur'an. And from that, everything comes. That's the foundation. So the Qur'an sets this whole thing in motion. And now we're on a planet in which one out of every five people believes in the Qur'an as a revelation from God. So this began with one man given this revelation from an angel. Now, the Qur'an, they say that the Muslim view is that the Qur'an, unlike the Christian view, the Qur'an is only in Arabic. A Christian will generally say, when they speak about the Bible, they'll say, well, it says in the Bible. A Muslim would never say that about Yusuf Ali's commentary if they understand Islam. 
they'll say, well, the translation says. They will never say the Quran says. You should not say that. Because a translation is ultimately an interpretation. And therefore, no Muslim accepts any translation of the Quran as definitive. There is no definitive translation of the Quran because of the nature of the Arabic language and the nature of language in general. Every language has the possibility of multiple interpretations. 